Hello, my friends. Let me ask you something. Do you suffer from feelings of low self-worth, depression, anxiety? Are you having trouble at work? Are your relationships suffering? Do you often procrastinate and avoid doing things that you know you need to get done? Do you have trouble putting down the bottle or the pills or the meth? Do you find yourself unable to get things done or feeling excessively guilty because you spend so much time on pornography or sex? Maybe you can't control the amount of food you eat. Maybe you're having troubling thoughts you can't control and you can't sleep or you sleep too much. Some of these things are sounding familiar, aren't they? And you're probably wondering about psychotherapy. You're wondering about a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a social worker or another professional who can help you feel better. Your troubles are the troubles of the modern world, my child. And the remedy you seek is a remedy of the modern world. Let's first talk about what troubles you. Once we have a way to talk about that, we'll talk about available contemporary psychotherapeutic treatment and who delivers it. I'm going to help you to become a more sophisticated consumer of psychotherapy. Now, for most people who have issues such as those I just mentioned, we can likely think of your problems as issues of adjustment. This means essentially that at one time you weren't feeling so bad, then something in your life changed, and now you feel bad. In other words, you didn't adequately adjust to the change. Now, this isn't trivial, and it doesn't mean you're weak or deficient. It doesn't mean you necessarily even know what changed. Anxiety, depression, and the many behaviors associated with these things can cause us to become trapped in conflicted emotions we can't seem to control. It can feed back on itself in your mind in ways that we're not even aware of. It can make everything in the world seem impossible and hopeless. At the same time, it could be that you can't even recall the time when you didn't feel this way. There are three things that have come together to produce what you are now experiencing. You, the environment that you're in and have been in, and the interaction of the two. Everyone's body is different, therefore everyone's nervous system is different, and therefore people innately vary in traits that come into play here. At the same time, you're a product of your experiences as well, and maybe you learned or were taught self-defeating or maladaptive ways of thinking and acting. But ultimately, it's the way your body and your experiences interact that produces what you're now feeling. It's a lot to tease apart. I wish I could tell you from a scientific perspective the details of how your physiology works regarding emotional experience and thinking and how the environment comes to bear on it. But not even the Reverend Doctor can do that. No one can. The fact is that science simply hasn't yet been able to tell us. We have some of the story and we know how bits and pieces of it work, but we don't know enough to create effective solutions to the problems you're now experiencing. And that's an important point I want you to remember. No one, and I mean no one, has a detailed factual understanding of how mental health really works. No one. Science, reason, logic have all given us clues, but that's all. And there's no such thing as reliably effective mental health treatment. Now repeat that after me. There is no such thing as, re as reliably effective mental health treatment. Now this doesn't mean that you shouldn't seek help. And it doesn't mean treatment can't be helpful. It can. But this isn't like seeking treatment for diabetes or a broken leg. To alleviate your pain, a couple of things are going to have to happen. One way or another, you need to change some things about yourself, things in the environment, and or the way you interact with the environment. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Changing long-standing and possibly innate behavioral patterns, very, very hard to do. 
but it isn't impossible, and you simply may have no other choice. Among the hardest parts is to understand what to change and how. Again, nobody knows enough to tell you. It's going to take a great deal of courage and tenacity for you to put the pieces together and make change work. However, sometimes that takes help. As I said earlier, we have clues about mental health that have come to us from science, also from philosophy, religion, and other ways of trying to understand the world and ourselves. At the same time, mental health problems and emotional suffering have been around since the dawn of time. For that reason, we have many different schools of thought about how it works and what to do about it when it seems to be off kilter. Now that makes it confusing, I know. So who do we turn to for help? What sorts of help are available? Remember, people have been struggling with mental health issues since the dawn of time, and there are many different ways to think about and approach the issue. I'm going to describe the most common approaches or systems of psychotherapy you're likely, likely to encounter in the contemporary mental health industry. Now, these modes of operation are not necessarily mutually exclusive. And remember, none of them should be considered to have a handle on truth. The first line of treatment is usually psychiatric. In other words, if a pill helps, take the pill. Now, this treatment is delivered by a physician, a physician who is often a general practitioner, but could be a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist is a physician with a specialty in mental health. And while it's possible to find psychiatrists who've received training in talk therapy, most commonly the approach is one of diagnose and prescribe. The psychiatrist will interview you and try to map features about what you're experiencing to a specific mental health diagnosis. Based on the diagnosis, the psychiatrist will prescribe you one or more medications. It's important to remember that diagnosis in psychiatry doesn't really mean the same thing as diagnosis in other medical specialties because Generally speaking, again, there is no well understood physiological process to treat. Psychiatric drugs are used because they are shown to provide better than chance treatment efficacy with manageable side effects. Their actual mechanism of action is often unknown. SSRIs are a good example of this. You've no doubt seen the ads on TV for various selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors Prozac, Paxil being a couple of very common ones. And uh, in a nutshell, these inhibit the reuptake of the neurotransmitter serotonin, which is thought to be related to mood. But the specifics of this relationship are unknown. In clinical trials, SSRIs produce better than chance improvement in depressed patients, but we're not certain why this happens. Also, while treatment efficacy is better than chance, it's still not particularly good for most people. Now, does that mean you should stay away from psychiatrist or pill-based treatments? No, not at all. Pills can help. Sometimes you don't have a lot of other options. So if a physician thinks a particular pill or collection of pills will help you, my general advice is to try it. Other approaches fall into what you could call talk therapies. And there are lots of these. There are many different schools of thought here, and it can get confusing. Most types of talk therapies generally fall along three basic lines, behavioral, humanistic, and psychodynamic. Different authors will conceptualize these in slightly different ways, but I'm, organized things, I'm organizing things this way because it's generally accurate and it's easy to track along with. Behavioral approaches tend to de-emphasize the role of an unconscious mind in favor of teaching active practices that change behaviors associated with mental illness. On the one end of this, you could find things like behavioral inventories and the identification of instances of classical and operant conditioning that work to maintain the unwanted behavior. Behavior could in, you know, would include things like patterns of thinking and the creation of behavioral modification programs in which old condition responses are eliminated and new ones created. Currently, cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, probably the most common example of this general approach. CBT is based on the idea that specific maladaptive ways of thinking about yourself and the world 
lead to the activation of a maladaptive emotional response, which you experience as anxiety, depression, and related maladies. A CBT therapist is likely to have you read some literature about cognitive distortions or maladaptive ways of thinking and to talk to you and help you discover examples of these distortions in your own thinking. It tries to be based on scientific research, but again, science hasn't yet told us enough to create an effective, thoroughly scientific treatment. Nonetheless, many people find CBT helpful. In combination with medication, CBT is probably the most common mode of therapy being offered at present. Humanistic approaches tend to look toward the therapeutic relationship itself as a mechanism of treatment and feature the therapist as provider of unconditional positive regard toward the client. The therapist will seek to uncover or help you uncover your strengths and your unique ways of approaching the world and will work to bolster and support your own search for meaning and happiness. Whereas CBT tends to focus on specific symptoms such as depression and anxiety, humanistic approaches tend to focus on the entire individual. Psychodynamic or psychoanalytic approaches share the belief that internal unconscious processes are at work within your mind and these things drive your experience of negative emotions. The goal of this form of therapy is gener generally to understand the nature of these forces and how they have developed. By gaining this understanding, you'll be able to overcome parts of your mental life where these forces have created undesirable feelings and behaviors. This form of therapy tends to be very time intensive as significant parts of your life story will need to be investigated. Now I'm gonna keep this discussion of modes of therapy a bit brief because honestly, a lot of what you experience in psychotherapy is gonna have as much to do with the personality individual attributes of the therapist as it does with any specific modality they may be using. Remember the mantra, there is no reliably effective treatment. None of the modes of therapy I've mentioned will necessarily work better than another for any given individual seeking treatment. And any one or combination might be helpful, but might not be. And how the therapy of any kind is delivered by the therapist is going to make a big difference. When you read the scientific literature on treatment efficacy, in other words, when researchers measure feelings of mental distress before and after psychotherapy, they find that most of the time the mode of therapy doesn't make a huge difference. Also, it's not uncommon in these studies to find that things like talking to a good friend or a religious leader can make as much of a difference as professional psychotherapy. Now, I think the reason for this is that when you're in psychological and emotional crisis, and therefore most likely to reach out for help, your mental world is awash in conflicted, powerful, negative emotions. It's confusing and disorienting, and you can't even trust your own thoughts. The thing that talking to a good friend or a preacher or Lacanian analyst, or cognitive behavioral therapist, or humanistic therapist does, is it helps give you a way to structure these out-of-control thoughts and emotions so you can regain some control. All the systems of psychotherapy that I've mentioned help you create a narrative into which your current experience can be placed. And that helps. Sometimes it helps a lot. So I'm not going to advocate one form of psychotherapy over another. You might find any of them helpful or unhelpful, and you may need to try more than one. Now, something else to consider is the training and education of people who deliver psychotherapy. Now, people are usually in a very vulnerable emotional state when they seek therapy. It's critical that the therapist have the wisdom and take the responsibility necessary to help shepherd you through the therapeutic process in a way that's healthy for you. And that brings up an important point. Maybe even a little more confusing than modes of therapy is the issue of who exactly can deliver psychotherapy. Now, honestly, this is tricky. First, let's talk about state licensing or government licensing of psychotherapists. Every individual country and every U.S. state 
sets its own rules with regard to the licensing and official qualification of psychotherapists. And most of the time, these qualifications are minimal. There are thousands of quacks delivering psychotherapy completely within the law. So remember that and be careful. Proper licensing alone isn't enough of a qualification, and it means very little. This is particularly important to remember in this age of therapy apps and long lists of potential psychotherapists about whom you know very little. The next thing to consider is education of the therapist. Most government regulatory agencies require the therapist to have, to have earned a master's degree at a minimum, but this can come from a wide variety of academic areas. However, I recommend you seek a therapist with a doctorate from a regionally accredited university. And here's why. You can find master's level therapists with degrees from education to social, social work to psychology and other fields. Each of these people will have had training specific to that particular academic area. However, remember when I said that nobody truly understands mental health and how to achieve or maintain it. Consider that a master's level therapist has spent two years or less, and often much less, studying the issue and learning how to address it before jumping into the therapist's chair. This just isn't enough work to mean much, and it does not indicate a subject matter knowledge up to the task. Think about it this way. Someone could spend two years studying, say, nursing, come out with a list of effective skills for treating sick people. Reason for this is simple. Science has told us enough about the human body, disease processes, etc., that a two-year nursing program could be filled with real practical knowledge and skill. But science hasn't told us enough about mental health. Just isn't possible to learn enough in two years to be a generally effective psychotherapist. Also, the barrier to entry in these fields can often be so low that just about any breathing organism who can take out enough of a loan to pay for the education can enroll in a master's degree program, take the classes, and become a fully licensed psychotherapist. You'd require more out of an accountant or the mechanic who works on your car, for example, so don't let an underqualified psychotherapist baffle you with bullshit. This isn't to say that there are no good master's level therapists just that it probably has more to do with the attributes of those particular people than it does with any training they've received. So in summary, unless you've been given a referral to a master's level therapist by a source you trust, stay away from them. This includes master's level social workers, counselors, etc. American Psychological Association, for example, does not at present time accredit master's degree level programs, and you cannot call yourself a psychologist without a doctorate. This, of course, doesn't mean that a psychotherapist with a PhD is guaranteed to be good, just that it's probably a little more likely that they will be because at least these therapists have had to spend five or six years studying and researching mental health before hanging out a shingle. Now, let me address another issue many young people seem to wrestle with here. If the environment is so important, what's the impact of capitalism? Maybe capitalism creates conditions that make mental health problems more likely or more severe. So maybe it's capitalism we should look at changing. And to that, I say, yeah, I'm sure capitalism does make mental health problems more severe and more likely. That is simply another way of saying that there's little doubt that the, that the society in which we live put stressors on us that we may have trouble adjusting to or dealing with. And we should certainly work to change those things about society. But that doesn't take the burden of change off of you. You are ultimately responsible for your own mental health and you have to be willing to fight for it. The, hold card f the hard cold fact is that in your lifetime, you will not see a change in society so great that it's able to alleviate the psychological and emotional issues you are experiencing.
it won't happen. So don't blame capitalism so much and instead get to work on yourself. Now, to the extent you can blame capitalism, realize that your ability to change yourself is far greater than your ability to vanquish capitalism. I sometimes hear a similar refrain among proponents of one specific treatment modality over all others. For example, treatment A is a product of big pharma, whereas treatment B is the truth. Stay away from this sort of thinking as well. Of course, big pharma has a financial interest in some approaches versus others. Doesn't mean those approaches can't help. So let's summarize. You're suffering psychologically and emotionally, and you want to know what modern psychotherapy can do for you. Modern psychotherapy can help, but it's not likely to be a cure or fix-all. Under the best of circumstances, you're going to have to do some very difficult personal work, so be prepared for that. While you can blame capitalism, or bad parents, or failing schools, or any number of things for what you're experiencing, in the end, you're still going to have to be responsible for your own well-being, and this means being prepared to do the hard work of personal change. Medication and psychotherapy can help, and you should seriously consider both. Medication can be prescribed by either your general practitioner or psychiatrist, neither of whom is likely to offer talk therapy. You may have to try more than one medication. It's unlikely to be a cure, but it might help you feel better. There are current approaches to talking forms of psychotherapy, and each can be delivered by therapists with vastly different levels of education. The mode of psychotherapy is probably not as important as the individual therapists, because the attribute of the individual therapist makes a big difference, and the mode of therapy probably less so. While you might find a good therapist holding only a master's degree, the barriers to entry for master's level therapists are so low, I'd advise instead looking for a therapist with a doctorate in their field of practice. It's by no means a guarantee of a good therapist, but I think it does raise the chances, at least, of finding a good one. Our time together must come to an end, my child. The Reverend Doctor gives you his blessing and hope for improved mental health and functioning. I must return now to the place my children cannot go. Please like, subscribe, retweet, mention, or otherwise support and get the word out for Sublation Media in its quest. Be well, my friends. I am the Reverend, Dr. John Milton Bunch.